Welcome, novice. I see you are eager to join the fight. If you are ready to accept this challenge, your training will begin automatically, or you can select Basic Training. If you are a returning veteran, you may review the mission of your choice by selecting one of the mission buttons. To explore Horde's mechanical twin of steam-powered miniatures combat, select War Machine. You may return to this mission selection with the main mission menu button at any time during your training. Good luck. Hordes is a fast-paced and aggressive 32mm tabletop miniatures battle game for two or more players set in the steam-powered fantasy world of the Iron Kingdoms. Each player takes on the role of a mystic battle shaman known as a warlock. Warlocks act as the commanders of their armies, and though they are formidable combatants on their own, their true strength is drawn from a parasitic synergy with packs of savage war beasts. War beasts, called beasts for short, are large and monstrous creatures trained for combat. A war beast's primal fury makes both itself and its warlock more than a match for any technologically advanced armies that might threaten the wild terrain. Each horde's combatant is represented on the tabletop by a highly detailed and dramatically posed miniature figurine referred to as a model. Players collect, assemble, and paint these models to represent the varied men, machines, and creatures in their army. This video series will teach you the basic rules for using these models in swift and brutal conflict. A Horde's army is built around a battle group. The battle group forms the heart of every Horde's army and is composed of a warlock and his war beasts. Squads of soldiers and support teams can further bolster a battle group's combat capability. The warlock is the tie binding the battle group together, but is also its weakest link. If the warlock falls, his beasts will lose interest in the fight and revert back to their wild instincts. Therefore, protecting your warlock is of utmost importance. If you destroy your opponent's warlock, you immediately win the game. There are several basic model types in hordes. Warlocks, troopers, solos, and war beasts. The physical size and mass of a model are reflected by its base size. Generally speaking, most human-sized warrior models have small bases, light war beasts and large creatures have medium bases, and heavy war beasts and very large creatures have large bases. Each model or unit has one or sometimes multiple stat cards that provide the model's combat qualities. A stat card provides a quick in-game reference for a model's name and type, basic combat stats, weapons, damage tracking, and any special abilities or spells the model may have. Hordes is typically played on a four foot by four foot table, also known as the battlefield. The battlefield usually has various pieces of terrain placed on it, representing things like buildings, walls, forests, and hills. To begin a game, each player rolls a six-sided die, abbreviated D6. The player who rolls highest chooses whether to go first or second, in this game, the Scorn player wins the roll and decides to go first. The Trollbloods player, who lost the roll, chooses which table edge he wants to use. The Scorn player takes the opposite table edge. Next, the Scorn player deploys her models anywhere within 7 inches of her chosen table edge. Then the Trollbloods player deploys his models anywhere within 10 inches of his chosen table edge. In this example game, the cruel warlock Master Tormentor Morgul and his forces face off against the sturdy trolls of Madrak Ironhide, Thornwood Chieftain. Horde's battles are fought in a series of game rounds. Each game round, every player takes a turn in the order established during setup. In our example game, I'm playing Scorn and will go first, followed by the Trollbloods player. Once the last player in the turn order completes his turn, the game round ends. A new game round then begins, starting again with the first player. Game rounds continue until one side wins the game. A player's turn has three phases. The maintenance phase, the control phase, and the activation phase. During the maintenance phase, a player's warlock removes all fury points in excess of its fury stat. 
Next, he checks for the expiration of continuous effects on any models he controls, and resolves the effects of those that remain in play. Finally, resolve all other effects that occur during the maintenance phase. During the course of a confrontation, warlocks continually draw on a magical energy called Fury. Fury represents a warlock's innate magical power and allows him to boost his own combat abilities and those of his warbeasts, as well as to cast powerful spells. During the control phase, a player's warlock can replenish its fury by leeching any number of fury points from his warbies up to his current fury status listed on his card. Fury may be leeched from warbies that are both in the warlock's battle group and in its control area. Fury may also be leeched from the warlock's own life force. For each fury point leeched this way, the warlock suffers one damage. Additionally, Spirit Bond allows a Warlock to choose to gain up to one Fury Point for each medium-based or larger war beast in his battle group that was destroyed in play. A Warlock's Fury stat determines its control range. A Warlock's control range is a circular area centered on a Warlock model with a radius that extends out from the edge of its base a number of inches equal to twice its Fury stat. Master Tormentor Morgul has a Fury stat of 5, so his control range is 10 inches. In the next part of the control phase, a Warlock can spend any remaining Fury points to maintain any upkeep spells in play at the cost of one Fury point per spell. If a model does not spend Fury points to maintain an upkeep spell, the spell expires. Next, a player makes a threshold check for each of his Warlock's Warbeasts with one or more Fury points left on it, any Warbeasts that fail immediately frenzy. Finally, a player resolves all other effects that occur during the control phase. For my first turn, Morgul begins the game with 5 Fury Points. With no upkeep spells to maintain or other effects to resolve, I move on to the activation phase. The activation phase is the main part of a player's turn. All models in an army must be activated once per turn. They are activated one at a time in the order the player chooses. When a model activates, it is granted its normal movement and its combat action. The normal movement must be resolved before the action is made. There are four types of movement available to a model. Full advance, run, charge, and aim. The speed stat listed on a model's card determines how far in inches that model can move during a full advance. A model with a speed of 6 can advance 6 inches. A model can change its facing at any time during a full advance. A model that runs advances up to twice its current speed in inches. A war beast must be forced to be able to run. A model that uses its normal movement to run cannot make an action, cast spells, or use feats during that activation. If a model runs, its activation ends immediately after moving. Forcing a war beast allows it to use its innate primal energy to achieve powerful effects. A war beast gains one fury point each time it is forced and can only be forced while in its controlling warlock's control area. A Warbeast can be forced several times during its activation, but it can never have a Fury Point total higher than its current Fury stat and cannot be forced if the Fury Point gained would cause it to exceed its current Fury stat. Fury Points remain on Warbeasts until removed by Leeching, Reaving, or a special rule. During its activation, a Warbeast can be forced for the sole purpose of gaining Fury Points. This is called Riling. When a war beast is riled, it can gain any number of fury points but cannot exceed its current fury stat. A war beast can be riled even if it runs. First, I activate the Cyclops Savage, a light war beast, forcing it to run. It receives one fury point and moves up to double its speed of six for a total of 12 inches. Then its activation ends. Next, I activate my Warlock, Master Tormentor Morgul. Then he prepares to cast a spell. Some models in Hordes have the ability to cast spells during their activations. 
Warlocks spend Fury to cast spells, and doing so does not use up their combat action for the turn. A Warlock can cast as many spells as he has the Fury to spend, and spells can be cast at any time during a Warlock's activation, but cannot interrupt his movement or attack. However, a Warlock cannot cast spells during an activation in which he runs. To cast a spell on another model, the spellcaster must first be able to see it. To determine a model has line of sight to a target model, the target model must be in the first model's front arc. A model's front arc is determined by its shoulder orientation. The 180 degree arc in the direction its shoulders face is the model's front arc. Volume is used for determining line of sight between models. Each model is considered to occupy a volume of space above the bottom of its base. The volume is determined by the base size, regardless of the actual size and shape of the model. To determine line of sight, draw a straight line from any part of the first model's volume in its front arc to any part of the target model's volume. The line drawn between the two models does not cross through any terrain, other models, or any other effect that blocks line of sight. The first model has line of sight and can see the target model. Once line of sight is determined between the spellcaster and his target, check the spell's stat line on the spellcaster's card. The cost of the spell is the amount of fury a model needs to spend to cast it. The spell's range is the maximum distance in inches a target can be from the spellcaster and still be affected by the spell. The distance is measured from any edge of the spellcaster's base to any edge of the target's base. The spell's area of effect, or AoE, is the diameter in inches of the template an AoE spell uses. A model with any part of its base covered by the template potentially suffers the spell's effects. A spell's power, or POW, is the amount of damage a spell inflicts and forms the basis of a spell's damage roll. If a spell's POW is marked with a dash, then that spell's effect does not inflict damage. A spell's duration determines how long the spell effect remains in play. Some spells have a duration of either one turn, one round, or remain in play only long enough to resolve their effects. An upkeep spell remains in play if the spellcaster spends one fury point to maintain it during the control phase. Finally, the offensive column determines whether or not the spell is a magic attack. If it is marked yes, then the spell is offensive and requires a magic attack roll to affect its target. If it is marked no, then the spell is not an offensive spell and the spellcaster does not have to make a successful magic attack against his target to use it. Each Warbeast has a powerful natural magic ability called an Animus. A Warbeast can be forced to use its Animus, or the Warlock who controls the Warbeast can treat the Animus as if it were one of his own spells while the Warbeast is in his control range. The stats of an Animus are typically the same as those for spells. A Warlock casting the Animus as a spell spends available Fury points equal to the cost of the Animus. However, when a war beast is forced to use its animus, it gains a number of fury points equal to the cost of the animus. I have Morgul cast the gladiator's animus, Rush, a non-offensive spell, on the titan gladiator itself. Morgul has line of sight to the gladiator and the distance to it is less than 6 inches so the spell can affect it. Morgul spends the spell's cost of 2 fury points. The spell is cast, and I place a token next to the gladiator to show that it is currently under the spell's effect. Morgul also casts Rush on the Cyclops Raider, a light war beast. He spends two more fury points to cast the spell onto the Raider. Next, Morgul uses his normal movement to make a full advance, moving up to his speed of 7 inches. Morgul has no ranged weapons, and there are no enemies within range of his melee weapons, so he forfeits his combat action, ending his activation. The Cyclops Raider activates next and also runs up to 14 inches, double its normal speed of 6 plus 2 inches for the Rush spell. The Titan Gladiator, a heavy war beast, activates in Riles, adding 1 Fury Point. Then I force it to run. The Rush Animus gives the Gladiator an extra 2 inches of movement this turn, so it can run up to 10 inches. Once it finishes its movement, its activation ends. Now the unit of Praetorian Swordsmen activates. I want them to run, so the leader gives the unit the press forward order. Units in Hordes activate a little differently than independent models like Warlocks and Warbeasts. 
Rather than activating individually, similarly trained and equipped models in a unit operate as a single force. All models in the unit activate simultaneously. When a unit makes its normal movement, each model or trooper in the unit can move up to its speed in inches. Troopers can be moved in any order. To run or charge, troopers in a unit need to receive the press forward order. Orders allow units to make specialized combat maneuvers during their activation. Orders are issued from the unit leader, and a trooper must be in formation to receive an order. A trooper is in formation if it is within the leader's command range, as determined by the leader's command stat in inches. For example, these Praetorian Swordsman troopers are all in formation because every trooper is within the leader's command range of 8 inches. When the swordsmen receive the press forward order, some troopers run into the nearby forest. As long as any part of a model's base is in rough terrain, such as a forest, it suffers a movement penalty that causes it to move at half speed, advancing only half an inch for every one inch of movement. Once the swordsmen have finished running, their activation ends. Since I have no models left to activate, my turn ends. Both rush spell effects expire at the end of my turn, and then I pass to my opponent. During my first maintenance phase, I have no continuous effects or other effects to resolve, so I move on to the control phase. For his first turn, Madrak Ironhide begins with five fury points, and with no fury to leech, no upkeep spells to maintain, or any other effects to resolve, I move on to the activation phase. During the activation phase, I activate the Troll Impaler, a light war beast, and it makes a full advance. Next, I force it to cast its animus, Far Strike, which will increase the range of its thrown spear attacks. The cost of the animus is 1, so the Impaler receives 1 Fury token and is now affected by the animus. For its action, the troll readies its spear to make a ranged attack against the Cyclops Raider. During its activation, a model may use its combat action to make a ranged attack. As with a spell, a ranged attack can only be declared against a target that is in a model's line of sight. A model using its combat action for ranged attacks can make one initial attack with each of its ranged weapons, as indicated by the ranged weapon icon. The weapon's range is the maximum distance in inches a target can be from the attacker and still be hit by the attack. The rate of fire, or ROF, is the number of initial attacks a model can make with this weapon during its activation. The area of effect, or AOE, is the diameter in inches of the template used for determining which models are hit by the attack. A model with any part of its base covered by the template potentially suffers damage from the weapon. Power, or POW, is the amount of damage the weapon will cause. The higher the number, the greater the damage. To determine the success of its ranged attack, the attacker uses its ranged attack value, or RAT, which represents its accuracy with ranged weapons. To make a ranged attack roll against the target, roll two six-sided dice, adding the result to the attacking model's RAT. However, attacking models can increase their chance to hit and add one extra die to the roll, this is called boosting. To boost a Warbeast attack roll, it must be forced. A Warlock must spend one Fury Point to boost his roll. A single roll can only be boosted once, so a model cannot be forced again to add another die to this attack roll. Defense, or DEF, represents a model's ability to avoid being hit by an attack. A model's size, quickness, skill, and even magical protection all contribute to its defense value. If the attack roll's total is greater than or equal to the target model's defense, the attacker scores a direct hit. Normally, the raider would be out of the thrown spear's range of 8 inches, but well under the effect of the far strike animus, the range of the impaler's ranged weapons are increased by plus 4 inches, which means it has range to the raider. For the attack roll, the impaler uses its rat of 5. The impaler is forced to boost the roll, gaining one fury point and adding another die. Normally, the raider's death is 13. 
However, because the raider is behind an obstacle, it receives a cover bonus. Terrain features such as walls, forests, smoke, buildings, or even spell effects can make it more difficult to hit a model with a ranged or magic attack. Depending on the type of terrain, a model can gain either a cover bonus or a concealment bonus to its defense against ranged and magic attacks. An obstruction, like a building, provides cover to models obscured by and within one inch of it. A terrain feature obscures a target model if you can draw a line from any part of the attacker's volume to any part of the target model's volume, and that line passes through that terrain feature. Because the raider is within one inch of the nearby building, it receives a plus four cover bonus to its defense against the ranged attack. The total attack roll is still higher than the raider's total defense, so it is hit by the impaler's thrown spear. In addition, two of the attack dice rolled show the same number, so it is a critical hit. The impaler's spear has the effect critical smite, allowing the model suffering a critical hit to be slammed away from the attacker. To determine the distance the model is slammed, I roll a d6. Since a 3 is rolled, the raider is moved 3 inches directly away from the impaler. Because it was slammed, the raider is knocked down and receives a knocked down token. A knocked down model has a base defense of 5, and melee attacks against it automatically hit. A knocked down model does not have a melee range, and they never block line of sight. A knocked down model cannot move, make actions, cast spells, or give orders. During its activation, a knocked down model can forfeit either its movement or its action to stand up. Additionally, a warbeast can be forced, or a warlock can spend one fury point during the control phase to shake knockdown and immediately stand up. Once a model has been hit by an attack, determine how much damage is dealt to a model by making a damage roll. A damage roll is made against the target's armor value, or arm, which represents its ability to resist being damaged. The higher the arm, the more damage it can resist. To make a damage roll, roll two six-sided dice. Then, add the attacking weapon's POW to the total. Just like attacks, damage rolls can be boosted to add a die to the roll. A model takes one point of damage for every point of damage that exceeds its armor value. A damage roll of 24 is 8 points higher than the target's armor of 16, so the target takes 8 points of damage. Damage to a Warbeast is recorded on the Damage Spiral on that model's stat card. Damage Spirals contain 6 branches, numbered 1 through 6. A Warbeast Damage Spiral has 3 color-coded sections called Aspects. The 3 Aspects are Body, Mind, and Spirit. If any of these aspects are crippled, meaning all the damaged boxes within them are filled, the Warbeast suffers a penalty to its performance. A d6 is rolled to determine in which branch the Warbeast takes the damage. Starting with the outwardmost unmarked box in the branch rolled and working inward, mark one damaged box per point of damage taken. Once a branch is full, continue to record the damage in the next branch in clockwise order that contains an unmarked damage box. Since all of the boxes for the Warbeast mind aspect have been marked, its mind is now crippled. While this aspect is crippled, a Warbeast rolls one fewer die when making attack rolls. Additionally, it cannot make chain attacks or special attacks, including power attacks. Since not all of the body aspect boxes are marked, the raider's body is not crippled. Unlike Warbeasts, Warlocks, and some troopers, do not have damaged spirals, but rather damaged tracks. When a warlock takes damage, fill in the appropriate number of boxes on his damaged track. When all of a model's damaged boxes are marked, that model is destroyed. Unlike warbeasts and warlocks, most trooper models do not have a damage capacity. They are destroyed when they suffer one damage point. When a model is destroyed, it is removed from the game. With no more ranged attacks to make, the Impaler ends its activation. Next, the unit of Trollkin Fenblades receives the press forward order, and all the troopers choose to run. Madrak Ironhide activates and makes a full advance. 
Next, he casts the spell Surefoot on the unit of Fenblades, giving them plus two death, and they cannot become knocked down. The cost of the spell is two, so Madrak spends two Fury Points to cast it. He has a clear line of sight to at least one trooper in the unit that is within the spell's range of six inches, so the entire unit is affected by the spell. After casting the spell, Madrak discards one Fury Point. During its activation, a Warlock can discard any number of Fury Points from itself, even if it runs. Choosing to spend no more Fury and having no targets in range of his weapons, he forfeits his action and ends his activation. I activate the Troll Bouncer and force it to run. Finally, I activate the Troll Axer and it also runs. Having no other models to activate, I end my turn, and play passes back to the Scorn player. During my maintenance phase, I have no continuous effects or other effects to resolve, so I move on to the control phase. During the control phase, the Cyclops Savage, the Cyclops Raider, and the Titan Gladiator are all in Morgul's control range, so he chooses to leech one Fury Point from the Savage, two Fury Points from the Gladiator, and one Fury Point from the Raider, bringing his Fury Points back up to five. I have no upkeep spells to maintain, and none of the Warbies in Morgul's battle group have Fury left on them, so no threshold checks need to be made. Then, I force the Cyclops Raider to shake the knockdown effect. With no other effects to resolve, I activate Morgul. I spend two Fury Points to cast the Rush Animus onto the Gladiator, I then spend two more Fury to have Morgul cast the spell Abuse on the Gladiator, providing a plus two bonus to both its speed and strength, but cruelly causing it to suffer damage. To determine the damage, roll a d6, divide the result by two, and round up. A roll of six is divided by two for a total of three damage. I roll again to determine where to apply the damage. I apply three damage to branch four of the Gladiator's Life Spiral. Next, Morgul heals the Cyclops Raider. At any time during its activation, a Warlock can heal by spending Fury Points to remove damage from himself or from Warbies in his battle group that are in his control range. Each Fury Point spent this way removes one damage point. Morgul spends one Fury Point to heal the Cyclops Raider, removing one damage point from branch number one. The Mind Aspect damage boxes are no longer completely filled, so that aspect is no longer crippled. Finally, Morgul makes a full advance and forfeits his action, ending his activation. I move on to the Gladiator, charging it into combat. A charging model uses both its movement and action to rush into melee combat. A war beast must be forced to charge. A model in a unit must receive the press forward order to charge, and all models in that unit must use their movement to either charge or run. Troopers in the same unit can charge the same target or multiple targets. First, the charging model turns to face a direction that will bring it within melee range of its target at the end of the charge. The model charges by advancing its current speed plus three inches in a straight line, stopping only when the charge target is in its melee range. At the end of its movement, the charging model turns to directly face its target and then makes a melee attack. To make a melee attack, the attacking model must have a target within its melee range. A model's melee range extends out a number of inches from its base in its front arc equal to its melee weapon's range. It engages any models within this range and can make melee attacks against them using its melee weapons. Models with no melee weapons have no melee range. When a model is making a charge, it must use its combat action to make an initial melee attack against the model charged. To make the initial melee attack, the attacker uses its melee attack value, or mat. A model's mat reflects its skill with melee weapons such as swords, spears, and even claws and teeth. The attacker chooses to make the attack with one of its melee weapons, as indicated on its stat card, by the melee weapon icon. For the attack, roll two dice, adding the total to the attacker's mat. A warlock may spend a fury point, or a war beast may be forced to boost the roll. 
If the total is greater than or equal to the target's defense, the attack hits. Damage from the attack is based on the POW of the weapon plus the model strength. The base total already appears on the stat card as P plus S or power plus strength. A normal melee damage roll uses 2d6, but models that charge get to boost the damage roll on their initial attack for free. The Gladiator makes its first melee attack against the Axer with one of its war gauntlets. The attack roll is greater than the Axer's defense of 12, so the attack hits. The damage roll is boosted for free, and the Gladiator also receives a strength bonus of plus 2 from the abuse spell. The attack causes a whopping 13 damage to branch 2 of the Axer's life spiral, crippling the body aspect. The Gladiator then makes an attack with its other war gauntlet. The attack hits and the damage roll causes 8 damage to branch 6, crippling the Axer's mind. The Gladiator then makes a melee attack using its tusks. The attack hits. The damage rolled is more than enough to destroy the Troll Axer. When a war beast in a warlock's battle group is destroyed while in its control area, the warlock can read the fury points on the war beast. Before removing the destroyed model from the table, remove its fury points and place them on the warlock. Madrak reaves the fury from the destroyed Axer, and the war beast is removed from the table. Once it has made its initial attacks, a warlock can spend fury to make additional melee attacks as part of its combat action. It can make one additional attack for each fury point spent, making as many attacks as it has fury to spend. A war beast can also be forced to make additional melee attacks as part of its combat action. It gains one fury point and can make one additional attack each time it is forced. When buying additional melee attacks, a model can choose to make the attack with any of its melee weapons. After destroying the Axer, I turn the Gladiator's attention to the Troll Bouncer and force it to make another attack with its War Gauntlet. Unfortunately, the attack misses. I force the Gladiator again to make another attack, and this time the attack hits, causing 10 damage. The Gladiator makes another attack, hitting and dealing 6 damage. I activate the Cyclops Savage, forcing it to charge the unit of Trollkin Fenblades. The Savage has only one melee weapon, the Falchion, with which to make an attack. The Fenblades get a plus two defense bonus from the Surefoot spell, so I decide to boost the attack roll, which hits. The boosted damage roll deals enough damage to destroy the Fenblade leader. However, the unit of Fenblades has the tough advantage, allowing models in the unit to potentially survive a fatal attack. My opponent makes a tough roll using a d6. On a 5 or 6, a model with tough is not destroyed, but is knocked down instead. A model that is knocked down loses tough. A roll of 5 means the Fenblade leader is not destroyed. However, models affected by the Surefoot spell cannot become knocked down. The Cyclops Savage is forced to make an additional attack, which hits the Fenblade. The attack causes damage, but my opponent does not roll a 5 or a 6 for the Fenblade's tough advantage, so the model is destroyed and removed from the table. Because the unit leader was destroyed, the Trollbloods player chooses a Grunt in the unit to field promote as the new leader, replacing the chosen Grunt model with the leader model. The Cyclops Raider activates and makes a full advance. I force the Raider to use its Animus, Far Strike. Then it makes a ranged attack against the Troll Bouncer. The Raider has Line of Sight, and thanks to Far Strike, the Bouncer's within range of the Raider's Heavy Reaver. In addition, the Bouncer's engaged in melee with the Titan Gladiator and will gain an additional plus 4 bonus to its defense. Needing to roll high, I force the Raider to boost the attack roll. Disaster strikes as I roll triple 1s. When any attack roll results in all 1s on the dice, the attack automatically misses regardless of the total. When a non-AOE ranged or magic attack misses its intended target engaged in melee, the attack might hit another combatant. Because the raider's heavy reaver shot missed the bouncer, I make another ranged attack roll to see if the shot hits the gladiator instead. The shot hits, but the damage roll is not high enough to cause any damage to the gladiator. 
After issuing the press forward order, one of the swordsmen charges the unit of Fenblades. As they are unable to charge into melee range with a target, I have the rest of the swordsmen run. Unfortunately, the swordsman trooper engaging the Fenblade is out of the leader's command range and will be unable to make attacks until he is back in formation. That ends my turn and play passes back to the Trollbuds player. I have no continuous effects to resolve in my maintenance phase. The Trollkin Fenblades have the Vengeance ability. During my maintenance phase, if one or more models in the unit were damaged by enemy attacks last round, each model can advance up to three inches and make one basic melee attack. The first Fenblade makes an attack against the Praetorian Swordsman. The attack hits and easily causes five damage, destroying the Swordsman. The next Fenblade attacks the Cyclops Savage, hitting and dealing it two damage. Another Fenblade also attacks the Cyclops, but misses. I have no other effects to resolve, so I move on to my control phase. Madrax still has three Fury Points left over from last turn. I leech one Fury Point from the Bouncer, and one from the Impaler. Since Madrak cannot have more Fury Points than his Fury stat of five, he is unable to leech the last Fury Point from the Impaler. I spend one Fury Point to upkeep Surefoot on the Fenblades. Next, I check to see if any of my Warbees still have Fury Points left on them. Since the Impaler still has a Fury Point remaining on it, it now must make a Threshold check. Threshold checks represent a Warlock trying to maintain control over a Warbeast and keep it from frenzying. To make a Threshold check, roll 2d6, adding the number of Fury Points on the Warbeast to the roll. Compare the total to the Warbeast Threshold stat, listed next to the Fury stat on its stat card. If the roll is equal to or less than the Warbeast Threshold stat, the check passes and the Warlock is able to maintain control over the Warbeast. Any Fury Points on a Warbeast that successfully passes its Threshold check remain on the Warbeast. If the roll is greater than the Warbeast Threshold stat, the Warbeast frenzies. A frenzied Warbeast immediately activates. It automatically shakes knockdown, stationary, and any other effects that can be shaken without being forced. It immediately charges the closest model in its line of sight without being forced, even if the closest model is a friendly model. It makes one attack against the model charged with its highest POW weapon that has melee range to the target. The attack roll is automatically boosted. If the Warbeast moved at least three inches during the charge, the damage roll is also boosted. At the end of the Warbeast Frenzy activation, it is no longer frenzied and you can remove any number of Fury Points from it. While a Warbeast is frenzied, it cannot be forced, use its Animus, make more than one attack, use special actions, special attacks, or other special rules. A Warbeast that frenzied in the control phase cannot activate during the activation phase. To make a threshold check for the Impaler, I add the Warbeast single fury point to the roll, resulting in a check of 11. Since the roll is greater than the Impaler's threshold of 9, the Warbeast frenzies. Because it is the closest model in its line of sight, the Impaler charges the Titan Gladiator. The Impaler makes its charge attack with its only melee weapon, its Battle Spear. Because the troll is frenzied, the attack roll is automatically boosted. The attack hits, and because the Impaler charged at least 3 inches, the damage roll is also boosted. The attack causes 4 damage to the Gladiator. Once it is frenzied, I choose to remove the Fury Point on it. I activate the Troll Bouncer and make a Ball and Chain melee attack against the Titan Gladiator. I force the Bouncer to boost both the attack roll and the damage roll, causing the Gladiator 7 points of damage. I force the Bouncer to make an additional attack against the Titan, which hits but causes no damage. Next, the unit of Fenblades advances, engaging both the Cyclops Savage and the unit of Praetorian Swordsman. 
During their combat action, two swordsmen are destroyed. Each of the Fenblades engaged with the Savage makes an attack against it, causing a total of seven damage. Finally, I activate Madrak. He charges the Titan Gladiator with his melee weapon, Rathrock. The attack hits, and the boosted damage roll causes six damage, crippling the mind aspect. I then decide to use his feet. Each warlock has a unique feat that can turn the tide of battle if used at the right time. Feats have powerful effects, such as granting additional protection from enemy attacks, granting increased strength or accuracy to their army, or even bringing models that have been destroyed back into play. A warlock can use his feet at any time during his activation. However, a warlock cannot use his feet if he ran during his activation. A feat can only be used once per battle, so use it wisely. Madrak's feat Crusher allows all friendly faction models in his control range to immediately make one melee or ranged attack. The Bouncer makes an attack against the Gladiator, which hits, but causes no damage. The Impaler also makes an attack against the Gladiator, but it misses. The Fenblades engaging the Cyclops Savage each make an attack, and the total damage is enough to destroy the War Beast. The Scorn player chooses not to reave the Cyclops' fury, so it is removed from the table. Madrak makes his own free attack against the Gladiator, hitting and causing 5 damage, crippling the Titan's spirit. Once the feat has been resolved, Madrak continues his activation and spends a fury point to make an additional attack against the Gladiator. The attack hits, and the boosted damage roll causes enough damage to destroy the heavy war beast. Morgul does not reave any of the fury points from the destroyed Gladiator, and they are removed from the table. With no models left to activate, the turn passes back to my opponent. At the beginning of my turn, I have no continuous effects or other effects to resolve in my maintenance phase. During the control phase, Morgul leeches all of the fury points from the Cyclops Raider. Morgul also chooses to gain up to one fury point from each of his destroyed war beasts, bringing his total back up to his maximum of five. With no upkeep spells to maintain or threshold checks to make, I move on to the activation phase. The Praetorian Swordsmen receive the press forward order, charging into the unit of Fenblades. Due to their tough ability, some of the Fenblades succeed at their tough checks. However, because of the Surefoot spell, none of them are knocked down. During the attacks, only one of the troll contributors is destroyed. The Cyclops Raider activates, and I force it to use its animus, Far Strike. I have the Raider use its movement to aim, which means it cannot advance, but it will receive a plus two bonus to its ranged attack rolls this turn. It has both range and line of sight to Madrak, so it makes a ranged attack against him, and I force it to boost the attack roll, which hits. I also force the Raider to boost the damage roll. In addition, the Raider's Heavy Reaver has the Burst Fire special ability, giving the weapon a plus one to damage rolls against medium-based models such as Madrak. The attack causes Madrak four damage. Madrak decides to transfer the damage to one of his War Beasts. When a Warlock suffers damage, he can immediately spend a Fury Point to transfer the damage to a War Beast in his battle group that is in his control area. The War Beast suffers the damage instead of the Warlock. When damage is transferred to a War Beast, the location of the damage is determined normally. Any damage exceeding the War Beast's unmarked damage circles is applied to the Warlock and cannot be transferred again. A Warlock cannot transfer damage to a War Beast that has a number of Fury Points on it equal to its Fury stat. Since the Bouncer has its max Fury of 3, Madrak can only transfer the damage to the Impaler. Madrak spends 1 Fury Point, and the War Beast takes the damage instead. Morgul activates, and I decide to use his own feat, Pain and Suffering, which prevents all non-Warlock models from spending Fury, being forced, or having damage transferred to them while in Morgul's control range. Seeing a chance to win the game, I have Morgul charge Madrak. The initial attack with the first Ripper hits, 
But before I roll the damage, my opponent decides to use Madrak's Scroll of Grindar's Perseverance. Once per game, when Madrak is directly hit by an attack, he may use the scroll to suffer no damage roll, so Madrak takes no damage from this attack. I attack with Morgul's second Ripper, which hits, and the boosted damage roll causes 6 damage. I spend a Fury Point to make an additional attack. Morgul's Rippers have the ability Double Strike, allowing Morgul to make 2 attacks for every Fury spent making additional attacks with this weapon. Morgul also has the special ability, Anatomical Precision. Whenever one of Morgul's melee damage rolls fails to exceed the arm of a living model hit, that model suffers 1 damage, and model's hit cannot make a tough roll. The first attack hits, but fails to exceed Madrak's armor. However, due to anatomical precision, Madrak still takes 1 point of damage. The second attack also hits, but fails to exceed Madrak's armor, so he takes 1 damage. Morgul spends another Fury Point to make two additional attacks. Both attacks hit, but fail to crack through Madrak's armor, so he takes one damage from each attack. I buy two more attacks. The first attack hits, and the damage roll causes Madrak to take three damage. The second attack also hits. I spend my last Fury Point to boost the damage roll, causing six damage. Unfortunately for Madrak, Morgul's feet prevents him from transferring the damage to a war beast. In addition, Morgul's anatomical precision ability also prevents Madrak from making a tough roll. With no more protection from the attack, Madrak takes the full damage which is enough to finish off the Trollkin Warlock. Whenever one player destroys another player's Warlock, that player wins the game. In the end, Master Tormentor Morgul and the vicious forces of Scorn emerge from their battle victorious over Chieftain Madrak Ironhide and his sturdy troll bloods. Now that you know the basics of fighting a battle in hordes, grab your models and start waging your own battles. Victory favors the bold, so bring it on, if you've got the medal. To get your hands on the minis used in this tutorial, visit your local hobby game store or order direct from store.privateerpress.com. For more videos on hordes and how to play at steam-powered twin war machine, visit our website via the on-screen link.